good to see, even though there's just about half of us here, but it's still good to see this half. And uh, trust the other half are watching online, as well as people maybe visiting us with us tonight or watching online that are not members of our congregation. We want to welcome you. Uh, this is a great church because they love Jesus and they take his word very seriously. And we just try to glorify him in, in a one united spirit. So, okay. Um, if you'd like, uh, for those of you who are watching online, uh, you might text your prayer request to this number, 615-681-0831. And in a few minutes, we'll have an invitation song. We've had people text in and ask for prayers, for forgiveness, or for blessings, or for thankfulness. And so, and that number works uh, at all times. So just uh, keep that written down. Okay, uh, Corey Waddell started about six and a half years ago, a tradition on the third Sunday night, questions and answers. Well, this is not the third Sunday night, but, uh, and I'm not Corey Waddell. <laughs> so we're going to do this a little bit differently. And I'm going to ask you the questions, and you have to answer them. So this is, uh, but you don't have to answer them out loud, but to answer them to yourself, I'm going to ask you a question, and think about the answers to these questions. The first question we have is why, in the Old Testament, did Israel ask for a king? Why did Israel, you, don't, you know, just, just think to yourself, see if you remember why it was, what did the Bible say, why did they ask for a king? Now up until this time, Israel was being governed or led, let's say, by people we would call judges. And uh, the book of Judges actually talks about 12 of those, although the books of Samuel would talks about a few others. But, um, and these judges weren't exactly dictators or kings. They weren't monarchs. They were just people that God raised up uh, during certain crisis time, especially for war or military activity. And uh, usually what happened would be that uh, Israel, like all of us, when we're so blessed, we tend to forget God. We kind of think all of my blessings, I'm responsible because I'm so strong or so smart and intelligent, wise, and I've just worked. So no, God is one who blesses us with everything that we have. And so they would kind of get that uh, proud uh, and self-centered attitude. And so then it would fall into some kind of destruction, uh, punishment from another, from another tribe or another people's. And so then they would realize they need God and they would humble themselves and ask for God's help. And then God would raise up a judge. But as time went on, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So Samuel, who was the last judge, he, he was old. And his sons didn't walk in, in the ways that God would have them walk. They were very sinful. And so they were in a difficult situation. Certainly a lack of faith that God would raise up another judge. Uh, the judges weren't necessarily uh, from certain families. They were all types of people from all different walks of life and different tribes. Uh, but they want a king like the other nations. And, you know, that desire to be like other people, uh, that's kind of part of our human nature. Nobody wants to be different. Uh, it's just kind of our human nature. We want to blend in. We want to be like everybody else. And so Israel wanted to be like everybody else. Well, it happens that, you know, we think, well, what, why would they want a king? Why wouldn't they want like a democracy or something? But, you know, throughout all of history, most countries and peoples have always been governed by a monarch. Uh, maybe a king or a queen or, or some royal family or some uh, one person that would take and, and democracy is a more of a modern experiment at least today in our country but uh, people want to be like other people uh, there's some photos from the 1920s and the styles you know like all the men wore those kind of hats and all the ladies wore those kind of hats it's just Nobody's making them do that, but they just wanted to do that because that's what everybody else is doing. Uh, for some of you older ones, remember in the late 60s when I was a teenage, young teenager, uh, to be cool, you had to have some fancy bell-bottom pants 
and uh, a nice vest with some tassels, maybe a leather vest with some tassels, and a big old peace medallion hanging around your neck. You know, so those are, and why would people dress like that? Well, because everybody else was doing it, and nobody wants to be different. Now, in the mid-70s, it gets even worse. Uh, guys that didn't even have curly hair would get permanents and have little afros. I don't know if anybody's guilty of that here in this audience. Probably not, but... Uh, and then actually men wore, now you wouldn't call them high heel shoes. No, they were men's shoes. So they were called platform shoes and big old heels. And if you had some white ones with a white belt, you were really cool. Okay. So everybody wanted to do that because everybody was doing that. Now today's style is that the more holes you have in your jeans and the more holes you have in your head and the crazier your hair, you're in style. So things change. Why would anybody dress like that? Because that's what everybody's doing. So when we want uh, to be like everyone else, it can really take you down the wrong road. Probably more young people have had their spiritual lives destroyed, not because they wanted to go that direction, but because the people they hang out, hung out with did all those things. You know, most people that get into drugs and alcohol things, they don't want to do that, but their friends are all doing that and they don't want to be different. And so they follow the crowd. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14, that the gate that the road that leads to destruction is wide. And there's a lot of people going that way. So young people remember that. Uh, don't, don't, don't worry about being different. God's calling us to be different. Now, uh, King Saul, God gave them king, the, the first king of Israel. King Saul was, was that one. He started out pretty good. He's pretty humble. But later on, he, he ended up in a terrible situation and it was taken, his kingship was taken away from him. But other than being like other, uh, uh, other nations, the, there, I believe there were other reasons that they wanted a king as well. For example, security. Because the judges were only raised up during special times. And so a king would be there with his forces and his armies all the time. And we would never get attacked, right? And, and stability. You know, if you don't really know who's going to be the next judge, but this, now if we have a king... We'll have stability in, in our country and we'll know who's in charge and, and, and also we'll have direction. You know, uh, good leaders set a direction for us and, and we'll know what's what. Um, I lived in Brazil for uh, the first six years I lived in Brazil. We had a military dictatorship. The military, backed by the American CIA, took over the democratic government because they had elected a communist president from a communist party. The country was going to go that way. And so in 1964, the, the military, the Brazilian military took over the government, a coup, and said in 20 years, we'll turn it back over to the civilian government. And they did. In 1985, then they turned it over, had elections. And during those 20 years, we didn't see any crime. Because, well, for various reasons. Uh, one is the police wouldn't put up with criminals and take them out and shoot them or, or do something else to them. So that's not, we didn't have justice, but we didn't have crime either. You could walk down three o'clock in the morning down the street, nobody would bother you today. Three o'clock in the afternoon, you'll get robbed. But also you never heard anything bad about the government. It sounded like everything you heard about the government was wonderful because if anybody said anything bad about the government, you would either be executed or at least exiled from the country. So but for the people that live there now, they think back in those times, oh, it was so good because we didn't have crime and the government, there wasn't so much corruption. Well, it's because you didn't know about the corruption. And the crime was done by the authorities themselves. So not always is a monarchy all that great, but the people wanted that because they envisioned security, stability, and direction for their lives. So in reality, it's not government that gives us what we need, but it's God. 90 days ago, Everything was wonderful. Stock markets were breaking records. Unemployment was at an all-time low. There were jobs to be filled. Everybody, every, everything was wonderful. And then in the blink of an eye, things just fell apart. Now, the government's scrambling to do it the best it can, and we need to pray for the government. The Bible teaches us to do that. But in the end, it's God that's going to bless us. It's God that's going to sustain us. How long can the government keep, keep, continue to hand out money that we've given them? or print money. And, and so the, it's a delicate situation. We don't know if this COVID-19 will ever get over. Will we always have to, to deal with this or other things that come along? And so in the end, God can use governments to bless us, but it's gov God that's ultimately responsible. So don't forget that. 
Okay, the true king of God's people is Jesus. The Bible talks a lot about Jesus as being a king. And I really appreciate uh, James, all the songs he led tonight. If you notice the theme about Jesus is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, beginning in Matthew chapter 2, uh, we have the magi or the wise men that came from the east to see and to worship the king of the Jews. The Bible says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That's a really interesting situation. The Bible doesn't explain a lot. How did those wise men know about this? Well, it could have been Maybe the influence from Daniel. You know, Daniel was taken to Babylon. He was in Babylonian captivity. And he, uh, God had given Daniel a vision of the future. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 14, talks about uh, the Son of Man coming and uh, being with the Ancient of Days. And, and, and the prophecy, so maybe through Daniel and generations of Bible teaching, and uh, maybe they knew about that the, the Messiah would come. We don't know. Or maybe it was just a direct revelation from God that told them and wanted them to come to bring those wealthy gifts that Joseph and Mary needed because they had to run off to Egypt uh, to save Jesus' life because Herod was out to kill all the baby boys. And so how would they sustain themselves down there in Egypt and that travel? So they came and brought them those wealthy gifts. And we don't know, but we, don't, we do know that people that weren't even from Israel understood that Jesus was the king of the Jews and he's to be worshiped. You know, there are some religions that don't believe that uh, Jesus is God. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses teach that he's a, he was an angel created by God, but he's not God. And, uh, but if you read the Bible, the Bible has all sorts of scenarios where we're worshiping Jesus and you can't worship anybody but God. And there's a lot of pastors we could talk about that, but that's very important. Another a, a group of non-Israelites that knew Jesus was the king, we're going to read a long passage now beginning in chapter 18. Open your Bibles up to John chapter 18. And we're going to read beginning at verse 12 all the way through chapter 19, verse 22, okay? It's a long reading, but it's very important because this is a, a trial. Jesus is uh, unjustly arrested, and then he's brought before uh, Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod and, uh, and mistreated and, and, and scorned, but all along this theme that, and understanding that Jesus is the king. So, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, obviously, they didn't have to bind him. He would have gone willingly because he came for this purpose. He came to, to die on the cross so he could save us from our sins. And, and certainly he could have called 10,000 angels uh, to, for his protection. But Or he, if his... He says even later that if his kingdom were of this world, his disciples would have kept him from being arrested. But, but anyway, they bind him. And in verse 13, the Bible says, First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Okay, now keep your finger in chapter 18, but go back to chapter 11 of John. And, and it's important that, that we... we interject this paragraph here. John chapter 11, beginning at verse uh, 45. John chapter 11, verse 45. It's important because he's going to explain what Caiaphas said and what he meant by it and how God used that uh, as, a, as a prophecy. John 11, verse 45. Now this is after Jesus uh, raises Lazarus from the dead and people were marveled and that's why he did it to show people that he's God in the flesh. It wasn't because he just felt sorry for Mary and Martha, their brother had died. No, he purposely waited until Lazarus died to go there to raise him from the dead. So now, verse 45, here's the aftermath. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Now the whole book of John is about our believing in Jesus as, as God in the flesh. It starts out in chapter 1, saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. 
And in the end of chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, These things are written in that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and by believing have eternal life. So, so one, once more, Jesus' miracles were to prove that he's God. So they saw what he did and they believed. Verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So they're, 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 well, I won't say, they're kind of spies maybe, you know, for the Pharisees. Like they're following Jesus and trying to just tell, let them know what's going on because the Pharisees wouldn't be caught dead there with Jesus' crowd. But, so they rush off and tell him what had done. Verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, <clears throat> they're worried about people believing in Jesus as the Messiah because the Jewish people had the understanding that when the Messiah came, it would be like a second King David and that he would get on his white horse and fight against the Romans and expel them from their country. And so uh, the, the Jewish leaders are worried that this false Messiah and their idea, idea is going to get them in trouble. And Caiaphas, he was the high priest for about 18 years. His father-in-law, Annas, was uh, a high priest for 10 years before him. But the governor had, uh, had taken him out, and Caiaphas was fairly good uh, high priest because he was able to keep a certain amount of peace between the Romans and the Jewish people. And so this is what he says. Verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for, that, for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, let's kill this guy so it will save our nation, so Rome won't won't attack us. You know, we're under siege, but they won't destroy us. Verse 51. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. So even though his heart is not in the right place, God is using him to prophesy uh, and, to, and to show us that his crucifixion was all part of God's plan. Verse, 50, uh, verse 52. Verse 52. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Okay, now back, go back to chapter 18. So we see why uh, the Bible says that Caiaphas was the one that said, it'd be better for one to die uh, for the whole nation. <clears throat> Verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. We're talking about John. Since, the, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Verse 17. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now I've been in Jerusalem at this same time of year during the Passover time and we had snow the first day I went into Jerusalem. You think of always Israel's being hot and desert and everybody walking around in, in sandals, but it was cold, okay? So they're warming themselves by the fire. Verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. In other words, he, wasn't, he didn't have some secret plan where he was going to raise up an army and, and fight and take over the nation. This was not about building an earthly kingdom. This is about the kingdom of heaven. And he says, why, verse 21, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. In other words, you don't have to take my word for it. There's thousands of witnesses around. Verse 22, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing, standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, 
bear witness about the wrong. But, what, but if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Verse 24. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. In other words, he didn't know what to do with him. Verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing, warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. It's so funny how people can be committing crimes. They're, they're unjustly arresting Jesus and wickedly wanting to put him to death, but we won't go into Pilate's headquarters because we don't want to defile ourselves ceremonially. We want to be able to eat the Passover. One time I was trying to help a young man who had left his family for a young teenager and he was on drugs and he was wanting help but he was so hooked on drugs and so I was trying to help him get into a drug rehab place. I got him into a place where we paid very little and they were going to take care of him. But instead of appreciating that and everything, he started fighting with everybody because he had been a Christian and he knew biblical doctrine so he started fighting and arguing and like... It's like they didn't want to be defiled, but they're willing to commit murder, willing to kill the Son of God. And so we have to be careful that we're not religious people, but down deep we're very wicked. <clears throat> Verse 29. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, would we we would not have delivered him over to you. In other words, they couldn't come up with a charge, so they just say, look, do you think we would bring you somebody and ask you to kill them if they weren't guilty of something? That was a, a pretty, sound like a pretty quick response. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So, Pilate realizes that he's not committed any crime. They can't even report any crime he's done. Obviously, it's something among what Jewish religion. And he said, no, take it and you guys handle it amongst yourselves. And then they say, well, we're not allowed to put anyone to death. Well, the old law of Moses, if somebody committed a crime, it's possible they could be stoned to death. But the Romans, after they occupied Israeli territory, would not permit the Jewish people to, to do that anymore. The only capital punishment could come from the Romans themselves. And so that's why they're bringing Jesus to the Romans for them to crucify him, to him to kill him. And so much so it says in verse 32, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. In other words, the Romans wouldn't stone somebody. They would crucify them. And it's just one more uh, proof of, of biblical inspiration here. Verse 33. So Pilate entered uh, his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, huh, what's truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. 
but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, pausing here, Pilate did not like the Jews. And his job, he didn't like even being there in Israel. His job was to keep peace, make sure Israel paid taxes to Rome, and, and keep things orderly. And so he sees this as just uh, an aggravation, a frustrating time, something that's not going to end well. And uh, so he's angry and he has Jesus flogged and they're making fun of him, you know, putting down the, the king of the Jews and hoping that will satisfy them. Now, verse six. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. So they understood very clearly that Jesus uh, was confessing that he is God in the flesh. The son of God means he has the same nature of God. It doesn't mean he's biologically an offspring of the father, but he's, he's the same nature. He's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. And they, they know that he's declaring through his miracles and through his teaching Verse 8, and they say he should be put to death because a man can't say they're God. It's blasphemy. Verse 8, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now, obviously, Pilate's heard something about Jesus. Herod certainly did, wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle. And Pilate's wife, it doesn't talk about it in this passage, but Pilate's wife had suffered that morning, early morning, that, that evening, that night, uh, in a dream because of Jesus. Had she known he was even there? I don't think so. I don't know if it was uh, a, maybe a providential dream. You know, at that time, G God did uh, sometimes communicate with people through dreams or visions. And maybe it was a providential um, opportunity for Pilate to, you know, his wife came and said, don't have anything to do with this man. It was, she knew it was not going to come out good for anybody, but he doesn't listen to her. And uh, so <clears throat> verse 9. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now, up until this time, Pilate's totally convinced. He's still convinced that Jesus is innocent. He's even afraid of him. He's really sensing him that he is truly the son of God, the king of the Jews. But now they blackmail him politically. They say, look, if you don't kill this man, you're going to get in trouble with Caesar. He's your boss. He's the emperor. And it, because anybody that says they're a king, that makes them an enemy of the emperor, the enemy of Caesar. And so he really doesn't have any choice now. Or he does, but he doesn't think he does. Verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was, all, it was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? 
The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Verse 18. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It's a sad story, but there's a, a victory coming soon. Everybody understands that Jesus, if they don't believe in him as the king of the Jews, at least they understand that he confessed or was understood to be by many people as king of the Jews. The, the Roman soldiers mocked him, put a crown of thorns, a purple robe on him and mocked him, but at least they understood who this man supposedly was. And Pilate wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, in, in three languages, Hebrew or Aramaic language, the Greek language, and the Latin language language. So the second question tonight that we want to pose, and this will be our last question, who is your king? Well, right away we might think, well, it's Jesus, but is he really? Or is he just a nice guy? Is he somebody you admire? Somebody, you know, you think a lot of, at least on Sundays? You know, in our, in our time, uh, we think of our stability and our safety and our direction coming from the government. Most people do. And our stars, you know, our, our movie stars and our singers and our sports heroes. You know, we even have King James. And, uh, and throughout history, we had Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. And um, there was all kinds of Tarzan, King of the Jungle. In Brazil, we have Hey Pelé, is King Pelé, you know, the greatest soccer player of all time. So who really is your king? Well, Jesus is my king. And I want to play for you just a, a three-minute video. It's by Dr. S.M. Lockridge. And maybe you've heard of it. This is an old recording. But he's just trying to describe who Jesus is. And, and, and I think it'll, it'll be an encouragement to you. The Bible says my king is a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. 
He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's my king. We want to have a song now and, and offer uh, this invitation that if you need the prayers of the church or if you want to know how to, uh, to change your life, how to become a Christian, how you can be united with him, uh, we just invite you to come forward or, or text us and we'll help you in any way that we can. Let's stand and sing.